Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kirsten Jensen, and I'm the Director of the Division of Benefits and Coverage for Medicaid at CMS. I'm joined today by several of my colleagues, including Michael Tankersley, Cherie Gaskins, Melissa Masato, Ryan Tisdale, Marlena Thieler, and Michelle Weller. Thank you for participating today. As you are aware, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, has scheduled four listening sessions centered on non-emergency medical transportation, or NEMT. I want to emphasize here that we are discussing NEMT today, not non-emergency transportation, or NET, as authorized through the 1915 C waivers. So please limit your discussion to non-emergency medical transportation, as that is the focus of this session. Under Section 209B3 of the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021, Division CC, Title II, CMS was directed to convene stakeholder engagement meetings to facilitate discussion and shared learning about the leading practices for improving Medicaid program integrity with NEMT services. CMS is very interested in your input on identifying the ongoing challenges to Medicaid program integrity, as well as the leading of practices to address these challenges. MITRE is facilitating these listening sessions on behalf of CMS. MITRE operates the Health Federally Funded Research and Development Center or the FFRDC for CMS. Uh, we will be uh, in listening um, mode, and I would like to hand the session over to Jeff Goldman from MITRE, who is facilitating today's listening session. Jeff? Thank you, Kirsten. And I too would like to welcome everybody that has joined today's listening session. Again, I'm Jeff Goldman with MITRE. The purpose of today's session is to gather input related to provider enrollment requirements eligibility determinations for providers and drivers. There will not be any presentations by CMS or MITRE, nor will there be any question and answer period. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Please be aware that this meeting is being recorded for note taking purposes. By remaining in this public meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. All chat comments will also be captured. For any press that have joined the call today, we kindly ask that you please remember to communicate through cms.gov slash newsroom. If you have any technical questions or difficulties, please reach out directly to Marvelyn Davis with CMS's moderated services, either via the Zoom chat or via email at marvelyn.davis1 at cms.hhs.gov. That will also be put in the chat for your convenience. All participants will be muted throughout the listening session until called on by the moderator, Marvelyn Davis. You can provide your input topic today in two ways, the raise hand feature or the chat feature. To verbally provide comments in this listening session, you use the raise hand feature. On the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window, you will see a raise hand icon. Click the raise hand and you will be placed in the queue and unmuted by the moderator when it's your turn to speak. Today's session is broken into five equal sessions. The first is for general comments on today's topic. Again, that's provider enrollment requirements and eligibility determinations for providers and drivers. That section will be followed by four specific sessions on subtopics. You are encouraged to raise your hand and offer comment or responses to comments in any or all of the sections. You may also use the chat function to offer your input. Due to the large volume of participants in today's session, we ask that you keep each of your comments to two minutes or less. As the facilitator, I will open each section by stating the topic for that particular section and then open the floor for comments. Commentators will be selected in the order in which their hands were raised. All hands will be lowered for the start of each new section. Your participation in this listening session is voluntary and there will be no individual benefit from your participation, nor will there be any negative effect if you decide you do not want to participate. 
We would like to hear your honest input about the topics. There are no right or wrong responses to any of the topics presented. We encourage you to speak openly and honestly. You can choose not to respond to a specific topic or subtopic. You can also end your participation in the discussion at any time. We have allotted up to 75 minutes for the discussion overall. Again, this focus of today is on non-emergency medical transportation, not non-emergency transportation. And today's session is focused on provider enrollment requirements and eligibility determinations for providers and drivers. As a reminder, we ask participants to keep their comments to two, under two minutes when you are called on to allow time for as many individuals as possible to share their feedback today. We will now open the session for discussion and comments. We will begin with the general topic, provider enrollment requirements and eligibility determinations for providers and drivers. Um, we will now open the floor for anybody that has comments regarding that topic. Sherry, your line is unmuted. Uh, I, I was, I think I clicked on that by mistake. Thanks. La Quinta, your line is unmuted. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? We can, yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, it's La Quinta. Um, I want to make sure I'm in the right place. So when you say non-emergency medical, you're talking about wheelchair van services? Hello? Yeah, so the topics for today are related to non-emergency medical transportation, which would include all of the resources that would uh, provide transportation to beneficiaries um, who are seeking uh, transportation for non-emergency reasons. Right, so I just wanna make sure that includes the ambulette, non-emergency, like the wheelchair vans. That's, that is correct, that would be in scope. Okay, all right. Thank you, Chuck, your line is on me. You said put it back on now, didn't you? I don't know what you were doing, just ask. Chuck, your line is unmuted. Gail, your line is unmuted. Gail, your hand is raised and your line is unmuted. Do you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so my question is in regards to driver background screenings, um, and maybe it's more of just an explanation that's needed for us. Um, we all know how difficult it is to hire these days. Um, sometimes we have applicants who things in their background were 20 plus years ago, um, but they're still being rejected as far as being able to be a driver. And this may be more in regards to um, a broker saying yes or no to that individual. I guess for us, maybe more of an explanation as to why so far back they're being rejected. Um, you know, we all want to give people a second chance in life, and uh, sometimes it's it's a challenge um, when there is something that happened 20 plus years ago is made it so that we can't hire them. So I guess that's my question. And I think this um, the discussion today is really set up to hear feedback on these topics. So okay. um, I think what we're hoping is that you have suggestions for what would best that uh, 
CMS can take into consideration when developing future policy. Okay. Thank you. Mary Ellen, your line is unmuted. Apparently, apparently I was in Hi. Room, so. Excuse me. Okay. Hello. Excuse me. When you're not speaking, please mute your line. Mary Ellen, your line is unmuted. We're ready for you. Okay. Yeah, I had a um a question similar to I think the first question is does this um uh, pertain to transportation for mental health um and substance abuse or is it medical? Sure, this is Kirsten Jensen. Um, if the mental health and substance use services are covered under the state plan for Medicaid, which most of them are, not all of them, but most of them are, um, this is transportation to medical services and those types of services would be considered medical services. Okay, and so it's transportation um, from where to where? like transportation to the facilities that provide these services or transportation from those facilities to like an emergency, a hospital or something if necessary. Like we have, we have clients who um, for various reasons maybe may not be able to make it to us. They don't have a car or whatever that is. Would it cover that type of transportation? It may. There are rules around it, and it's um, the state uh, Medicaid agency would tell, um, would would indicate what those rules are. So we're really looking for feedback on these policies, right? Um, we okay. are as as uh, Jeff has been describing. So I'm going to turn it back over to him to try to reset the conversation here. Um, we are seeking information to help inform us about policy. Uh, decisions through this conversation. So Jeff, could you uh, reset a little bit here so we can? Yes, I will. Thank you, Kirsten. So the purpose of today's call is to hear feedback around, as Kirsten said, the policies that impact non-emergency medical transportation. CMS is interested in hearing your feedback um, to take into account when developing future policy. So the input that you provide here today is very important and CMS is very interested in hearing your feedback. Um, it is not designed to be a question and answer session. It is designed to hear your thoughts on what could make the process run more smoothly, um, be more efficient, be more beneficiary centric, um, et cetera. So um, we, we wanna open the floor to folks that have comments on how policy may be improved to help improve the non-emergency medical transportation program and benefit for beneficiaries. Thank Marvel, you. I may be yes. open for the next participant. Yes. Right now, George Adams, your line is unmuted. Hi, my name's George. And one of the uh, requirements I would like to suggest for provider enrollment and eligibility determination for provider drivers would be for a requirement, one of them would be for the company that has a contract with the provider to see how many employees that they are employing to help better equip the non-medical uh, transportation to take people to doctors and dentists that are working for them. The next requirement I would ask, suggest, is for them to make sure that they have first aid on board for emergency reasons. Thirdly, for the provider requirement, again, is to, uh, for eligibility, is to uh, see how much that they qualify for, um, say, like if a client comes on board and someone has sugar diabetes, they should know automatically on how to take care of that person that has diabetes on the way to the doctors as to be one of the requirements. Thank you. Gail, your line is unmuted.
Gail, your line is unmuted. Oh, I think that one was an accident. Michelle, your line is unmuted. Thank you. Uh, again, my name, my name is Michelle Pavelchuk. I have, um, I understand that um, you said that we don't have, this is not a questions uh, session, but I think it would be important uh, for the states to have some clarification when it comes to two topics. So the first one has to do with what, what are this, what is CMS standpoint um, with the topic of the legalization of marijuana in some of the states, this is uh, this is creating some some issues. We I, I think it would be important to have some more clarification on what are the what are the conditions for a for a provider uh, when when checking the driver's background into what is what is allowed and what is not allowed based on this um, legalization in many of the states. That's one of the things that it will be important maybe to have some more clarification on that. Again, maybe not for this session since you guys are saying there are no questions, but I'm sure that if any state that has something, some input uh, to give us on this, that will be valuable. Another thing has to do, the second topic has to do with the regulations of usage of Lyft and Uber. Um, when we're talking about um, non-emergency medical transportation, I understand the CMS had uh, put some regulations in place by the end of last year, and it will be important to have some discussions over that, because in some of the states, providers are concerned about the overutilization of those two um, uh, for, the, for this type of transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. As we said, we, CMS will, will not be answering questions as part of this format. But if you have specific suggestions that you'd like um, related to the topics you brought up, um, may, please enter those in the chat. We can move on to the next caller. Thank you. Jeremy, your line is unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, mine's more around the new um, umpy requirement. Um, just want to get clarification if, because when we called DHS, they said, we didn't need to do it only if you're mode six, seven, or eight, and we do three and four. So I was, I, I didn't know if umpy was part of this discussion or if there was some clarification around umpy that could be talked about. Yeah, again, for callers on the line, um, we are interested in your suggestions on how these uh, areas uh, could be improved through policy. And so if you have specific um, suggestions, we would love to hear those and take those into account in future policy development. It was more around just is, I don't, there's no communication about UMPI. And so it's a requirement. Some the MCOs are saying it's required, but then DHS is saying it's not required. So I, I just want, that's my confusion, I guess, on what umpy is yeah so I, I i think i hear your input as uh it's confusing and clarification on that in the future would be helpful for sure uh, yep great thank you really appreciate thank, it yeah thank you christine your line is unmuted christina your line is unmuted Christine or Christina? Christina. Oh, I'm not Christina. No, I'm you're Christ it. You're oh, the okay. person. Perfect. Thank you. Um, comments that I have when we're talking about driver background screenings and neglect by drivers and subcontracted transportation ident identification. I'm not sure if there is any standard expectation in those areas that apply nationally or if those things are done state by state so I would recommend that we have some kind of concrete uh, screenings minimum screening standards I'm not sure if we're having drug tests on drivers but I think we need to have drug drug screening for any drivers and I would like to see some kind of mandated uh, training nationwide for drivers 
to address climate change and all the different horrible conditions that we have that drivers are having to face. And of course, those are times when we really need drivers. If we're calling for a driver for a person in a skilled nursing facility and it's snowing, it's because that person may be not be emergent, but could be emergent if they don't get to their appointment. So I would like to see really specific good driving training as a requirement for drivers. Um, that would be the same no matter you know where you were. I think that would make it a lot easier people. And then I guess clear, clear channels of communication when there are issues with drivers um, to make sure that it's required that a broker get back to um, anyone who has placed a complaint to make sure there's resolution and follow through on those complaints. So those are some of the things that I would think of. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. Lillian, your line is unmuted. Thank you. Um, one of the recommendations that I have is that Medicare CMS make it possible for any EMT providers that are not attached to EMS to provide services under Medicare and insurances. Another one is for them to look at the requirements of the drivers and truly consider people that have had issues with their background checks years past. Um, another one is they increase the reimbursement with the cost of gas going up and the cost of the employees going up when they can make $12 an hour at Taco Bell. The reimbursement really, really needs to go up. And if there's any way possible for them to decrease the NEMT insurance cost, that would be phenomenal. We opened our company to help our community and we find it constantly a battle to get to make ends meet just because of reimbursement and drivers. Thank you. Sherry, your line is unmuted. Thanks for um, listening. Um, is there a, a software that CMS would uh, use to have um, all the rules and regulations uh, in it so that the transportation providers can um, simply use that software and be able to know um, that maybe the destination is a medical center, maybe with the IVR call that verifies the destination and um, uh, also that has the billing service so that each transportation provider doesn't have to do their own billing service. Uh, or, or I guess that would be a suggestion if there is something that would be beneficial to each transportation provider. Great, thank you very much. Dan, your line is unmuted. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so uh, a couple things that I had thoughts on. One, I, I would love if CMS uh, could establish and, and de define that it, the in states in which a broker is used, that the provider still has a direct relationship or um, in some way a, a contract uh, with the Division of Medicaid. Um, that would greatly aid in, in a lot of uh, issues such as getting uh, fingerprinting services through states. Um, state where I'm in, we don't have fingerprinting services if you don't have a direct contract. So we have to go out and go to try to go to local police stations. So if that, if that relationship were established that even though it's a broker, the provider still contracted via Medicaid, that would be of great assistance. As to... Um, Standards and training, I, I would love CMS to, if they would take a look at um, uh, organizations such as NEMTAC that have uh, established accreditation standards for providers um, and training uh, for drivers and, and that if those could start to be sort of established and, and um, adopted on a, on a cross the state basis, all the states basis that would add to a lot of the uniformity I would also um, encourage that uh, 
um, when uh, CMS puts out rules that they um, promote um, providers to adopt technology and are a little more um, rapid in, in adopting the technology and changes that come from that. So that things, uh, for example, such as um, putting in odometers are, not, are no longer uh, you know, necessary for recording trip mileage when you have GPS data that, that has that. And I think that would go a long way towards um, preventing uh, fraud and, and, and uh, ghost trips from being out there. And um, with respect to training, and um, the, the different types of services, Uber and Lyft were mentioned that are now being allowed, that uh, there is a level of training that is, is adopted and is equal to the type of service you're provided so that if, if somebody is providing uh, services beyond just picking up and dropping off individuals, that they have training that would go beyond just that is that's necessary for driving um, and that there is a, a recognition that there's a difference between curb to curb and door to door and in between there is other additional services if you have to assist provide assistance to people which is quite often the case with respect to these types of uh, trips thank you very much thank you Dan, for your input we'll move on to the next participant Lillian, your line is unmuted. I'm sorry, I had already asked my questions or given my recommendations. Thank, Thank you. you. George, your line is unmuted. Hi, my name is George Adams again. Um, on one of the enrollment requirements and eligibility determinations for provider drivers, I would like to suggest CMS to give data to the brokerage and to their committee boards on the brokerages, data that um, is suggest that the data go to both um, the board of the brokerage and the brokerage of any changes that um, is affecting both consumer and providers. That's my suggestion. Once if CMS is to change anything um, on their level when it comes to brokerage and transportation. Great, thank you for that feedback. Julia, your line is unmuted. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of things on uh, returning citizens, those that are incarcerated and are coming back into the communities. Um, we've been very active in trying to get a program where they could be trained so that they're ready to work. We are a public transit agency. And so we have our own regulations and rules when it comes to being able to put them um, to do regular services. But I don't have a suggestion. I just would want to um, encourage that CMS not put in any regulations that would hinder us being able to hire nonviolent offenders um, as drivers in order to transfer transport any EMT um, people so that we could help with that driver shortage um, because that kind of helps everybody in our community. So um, just encouraging you to um, jump on board with that and, and help in any way that you can. And then the other thing is, um, I know people have talked a lot about the training and as a public transit agency, we do a lot of training with our drivers. And so if something is put in place that um, there is some kind of standard of training, I would like to, um, for you to also be mindful that public transportations that are already very regulated that still provide NEMT trips, we have a lot of this stuff already in place. And so I don't want that to hinder us having additional regulations and requirements 
of having to do things that we have already do internally, if that makes sense. Thank you. Great, thank you. Just want to uh, make sure that participants know that if you've already asked your question and your hand is still raised, you can click to uh, put your hand back down just so we have an accurate account of uh, how many people are in the queue still to make comment on this opening topic. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, your line is unmuted. Thank you. This is Robert Worth. I'm calling from the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, first of all, there's been a lot of comment about background checks. And this needs to be standardized so that we're really doing uh, the same background checks no matter who the provider is and no matter what the state, the state that they're in. Uh, the only really standard that really goes over all background checks for, for drivers is the gold standard of fingerprinting. And my suggestion is there, that there be a two-step process. Step one would be an applicant comes and applies for a job, a place of work. Then we be allowed to file with the, with the FBI for, for their um, federal background check on fingerprinting and then a temporary license be give or, or certification be given to the driver until that uh, determination is made that his background is, is clear. That way we can get people onboarded, they can start earning income, we can start providing transportation and then when the background comes back in, they, then uh, we can determine whether they're uh, clear to continue driving or not. The problem that, that exists is that uh, in, in many cases, especially when you start talking about using TNCs, uh, transportation network companies, Uber and Lyft and, and, the, and, and the, their ilk, is that they're performing local background checks. So take Virginia, for example. Virginia, in order to find out if a person has committed a heinous crime th throughout the state of Virginia, you have to go to the state repository and you have to get an affidavit signed and send it to the state. And then the state police does the statewide background check, which covers every county and city in the state of Virginia. And uh, what's being accepted is this local check that only gives you a check in the county that you're, che that you're actually checking. So if I committed a crime like murder in Richmond, Virginia, but I live in Arlington and you do uh, Virginia and you do a background check for me at Arlington, you're only getting the data that comes from Arlington. Now, having said that, I totally agree with the comments that we have to make these jobs, these entry level jobs eligible for people that have, that have maybe have felony backgrounds, but they're not violent. And that should be done immediately and denying a person that opportunity to work with a with a uh, a felon, for example, a drug conviction that might have been twenty years ago, uh, is really uh, taking away their their. Uh, it's an equity issue. So my suggestion is that CMS develop a matrix that will tell everybody where they where they stand and what type of disqualifying event won't allow you to drive. Uh, uh, for for Medicaid Medicaid transportation, the largest issue that we face nationwide is pertaining to the advent of brokers. And we know I think that there are twenty six states or maybe more, maybe less that are using brokers. And the brokers have cut the reimbursement rate to providers to the wick. They go with the lowest cost provider and which increases their profitability. And the poorer the service, the more profitable the broker becomes. Because if I'm not going to ride a service that's poor, that doesn't show up, that doesn't pick me up on time, where the vehicles aren't clean, where the drivers aren't vetted, and therefore the person doesn't ride anymore. And if you're using a capitated rate reimbursement rate, that that lack of providing that trip goes right to the broker's bottom line. What service in the world would you put out on the street where not providing the transportation is, is actually a benefit to the third, to the broker, the middle person? My suggestion is that you eliminate the middle person altogether. This is just a 
way of driving up costs to, to the states and go back to, this, to the programs where the local health departments, the local agencies contracted with providers in their community that they can regulate. This, the broker system has been, I'll give you an example. We had a reimbursement rate of $17 a trip. When the brokers came in, it went to $6 per trip. We did one and a half trips per hour. So that's $9 an hour. How are you gonna pay a driver? Uh, how are you gonna pay a driver a, a living wage if you're only being reversed $9? It really does not take into consideration the capitalization of the equipment. So after you, you at some point in time are going to need to replace your, your capital, your vehicles, and you need to have enough money to do that. So I really think a study, a study needs to be done. We really need to look at these reimbursement rates, especially now with gasoline at $5 uh, a gallon and the labor rate, you can't find drivers. The labor rates are exploding. We cannot hire drivers right now in the Washington DC area for $20 an hour. So how are we going to provide these services? So those are the two things, the background checks and the reimbursement rates. Thank you. Great, thank you, Robert, for your comments. Um, we do wanna remind uh, that we have as many as 40 people in the queue right now to speak. Uh, Correct. So their comments to uh, two minutes, that would really be appreciated, I think by everybody on the call. Um, also, we've noticed that um, we're getting comments that run, and you can see on the screen for those that are, um, that are, are online and seeing the slide, that we are touching a number of the subtopics. So we do wanna go ahead and open up the floor to if anyone's holding comments um, to till we get to their particular subtopic, to go ahead and get in the queue now. Um, and we'll just run through callers in order. Um, and you know, any, any subtopic related to uh, provider enrollment requirements, and eligibility determinations for providers and drivers is welcome at this time. Uh, so thank you and Marvelin, can we move on to the Caller. Yes, Bill. Your yeah. line. Yes. Yes, Bill Zeezer. Um, I work for the state of Virginia in the Medicaid program. What I would like to do is not take up two minutes and discuss everything that we do here, but I'd like to share our requirements for any EMT drivers and providers. Keep in mind that our brokerages have been in place since 2001, so we we have a lot of experience on adapting these with the changing times. Then listening to what's been said, such as things of utilizing the barrier crimes instead of uh, just if anybody's a convicted felon, um, they're not allowed to be a, a driver. The barrier crimes anyway, and we also have policy procedure on utilizing the TNCs. I'd like to send that information to you as well for you to review and take a look at how we're doing things in Virginia. Because I think, um, again, it has a lot of maturity built into it from having uh, brokers. Right now we have four brokers doing seven programs, statewide programs, and we keep consistency across the board with all the seven programs um, is quite, quite challenging, but we do do it, but by having the same policy procedures for provider driver enrollment. But again, I'd like to furnish that information to you to review. Thank you, Bill. And just a note to uh, folks on the call, we do have an email box, which um, someone will put into the chat um, to collect comments. Uh, we obviously do want to hear from, uh, from folks verbally and in the chat today, but if there are additional uh, items you want to share with us, we do have an email box that we will be accepting uh, further input. So thank you. Okay. Hey. Rachel, your line is unmuted. Hello. Um, I would like to recommend a further definition on the driver background yeah. screenings as far as the time frame that th that it needs to go back some states are silent some states are seven years 10 years and then if there is an instance um you know a felony that's over that specific time frame would those drivers be able to be approved um also some definition on on drug screenings would be um, very helpful um, as far as acceptance of lab screening versus um, dipstick screenings and um, 
and, and trying to avoid fraud in submitting background checks and drug screenings. Uh, the last thing that I have is any, um, if there's any thought to providing, I think it was um, maybe the, the second person before me that spoke, um, if there's any thought to a temporary credentialing or provisional credentialing where there's a set minimum requirement to allow the driver to drive while they're getting their, the rest, you know, all of their credentialing items to the broker. Thank you, Rachel. And, and, um, in response to something that was placed in the chat a moment ago, we do prefer uh, to hear from folks live today, either by a, a direct comment through the chat. Um, the email is there for, for any additional contact that you'd like to add um, after the session concludes, or if there's you know beyond the two minutes that you're able to speak, uh, if you want to offer additional information. So thank you, and we'll move on to the next caller. Sherelle, your line is unmuted. Hi. Is there going to be a policy that put in place on enforce about the way that the members that we pick up treat the drivers because we're running into a lot of disrespect and the members that we're picking up from the drivers. We discussed this several times before. Um, Sherelle, I think we're having a little difficulty picking up your voice. I don't know if there's a an opportunity to um, move closer to the microphone or our other options you may have. Do you hear me? Yeah, try again. I don't think we could hear you very well the first time. Okay, um, like I said, um, we're is there a policy in place or is there gonna be a policy in place or enforced about the disrespect for the members that we're picking up, that being picked up to the driver Another job is supposed to respect the members, but it needs to be a policy that we force for the members that we're picking up, disrespecting to the drivers, um, that information that their, like their addresses and phone numbers are not being, needs to be um, verified and correct because like I said, the gas is high and when you're driving 30, 40 miles to pick someone up, then they're not going or they just say they didn't know they had an appointment that's wasting time as well as gas. Um, or there's going to continue to be a policy about masks being worn um, when transporting. The drivers are wearing masks, but it's the beneficiaries needs to be make sure they're continuing to wear masks. And also, um, is there some type of policy that could be put in place or something with the brokers at the end of the year or quarterly? do like bonus checks for the provider um, that has had a certain um, standard throughout the quarter of the year to help supplement the pay that they're getting throughout the, throughout the year. Um, like I said, that was mainly one, one of my main ones, the bonus checks and the rate of reimbursement rates that are ridiculous sometimes. But that was about it for me. Thank you, Sherelle. Appreciate it. We'll move on to the next caller. Sue Ellen, your line is unmuted. Good afternoon. This is Sue Ellen Batiji. I'm from Vermont Medicaid. One of my suggestions would be um, allowing uh, the drivers to enroll with the Medicaid agency um, in, and perhaps um, following um, what we use for our physicians under the uh, CFR uh, 42 CFR 455, we could actually allow um, the drivers to be high risk providers, and then they would meet all the screening or most of the screening requirements um, to get fingerprinted. Perhaps also adding in, you know, drug uh, testing and other things. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. Adrian, your line is unmuted. 
Thank you. Um, the, the relationships that are between drivers and participants and driver background screenings, <clears throat> excuse me, the participants, as somebody else mentioned, can sometimes be unruly, unthoughtful, and um, callous about <laughs> receiving their transportation. Um, <clears throat> So guidance about what from CMS about what we are allowed to do about unruly participants and either suspending their services or moving them to a different service option. Additionally, it would be very helpful if there was a policy regarding the limited exclusions or LEIE, folks who cannot receive Medicaid reimbursement and how to adequately screen for that if choosing to use the TNCs like Uber and Lyft. So those types of um, guidance would be very, very helpful. Similar to what Vermont said, um, sorry, I don't recall your first name, um, enrolling the providers with the Medicaid agency as a provider and requiring as part of their enrollment for them to have registration with something like um, the Taxi and Limousine Commission or Public Service Commission can address some of the concerns, but the question that I guess we would need guidance from CMS would be whether or not enrollment with federal, you know, already in one federal agency's training, similar to what someone else said, um, whether enrollment with one agency's training for transportation would be transferable as acceptable with um, CMS. And then, um, I believe that was the uh, inability to deny transportation to folks who have a history. It goes back to the unruly or um, participants. It's just whether or not, given what's happening now with some of the behaviors and uh, even committing crimes while on the Medicaid covered transportation, the um, eliminating- A drug. Yeah. Wow. Sorry, eliminating the inability to suspend those who undertake um, illegal activities while on our vehicles. Thank you very much. Carolyn, just a reminder to folks that if you're, uh, if it's not your turn to uh, offer input, if you could just remain on mute. Thank you. Carolyn, your line is unmuted. Carolyn Lambert, your line is unmuted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. You have an echo, okay. yes. Okay, can you hear me still? Yes. We can hear you, Carolyn, please go ahead. Uh, Carolyn Lambert's line is muted, I see. Thomas Gibbs, your line is unmuted. Uh, yes, to the topic of driver background screenings, uh, we already have to submit to our insurance carriers, at least here in Alabama we do, I imagine it would be nationwide, um, driver background screenings for everybody that we have on our roster. So to, to sort of address the standardization, it would be more efficient to just all agree on one standard of background check and let's use the insurance industry as the standard possibly, because what what would be good for one agency isn't necessarily applying to the other agency and it, it makes for a lot of unnecessary reprocessing of people that have already been vetted by, for instance, the insurance industry. They have a better idea of how to assess their risk than anybody else. And it would be kind of nice to sort of have one standardized background um, check that we could submit for Medicaid as well as the insurance company and all the health carriers, all they all have their own particular requirements. So I guess trying to condense the amount of background choices we have to use. 
in the um, patient abuse um, topic. It's sort of, it's not part of the topic, but it has been brought up a couple of times, the, um, the abuse that has to sort of be endured. Y'all don't want us to hire felons to uh, drive, but we sometimes have to transport people that have felonies in their background. And it does sort of make drivers kind of nervous when they have to start showing up into really bad neighborhoods with people that, you know, are sort of avoiding around. So yeah, a little bit of help with the, uh, the quality of our Medicaid peak people that we have to pick up would be a good standard to, to kind of maybe, maybe put in place. And to the subcontract of transportation, I totally concur. The brokers are killing us in this business and Lyft and Uber are nowhere near as certified and as insured and as trained as we are. And they're gonna kill us on ambulatory rates all day, every day. And it's not fair to us. We've gone through a lot of steps to qualify. And if somebody can call Uber for a medical transport, Uber needs to have the same standard we do. Or lower our standards to them and we'll be happier. Thank you, Tom. Well, we will move on to the next caller. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Onella. Your line is unmuted. Uh, hi, um, my name is Onella Georgescu. Uh, I do have one suggestion to for the CMS. Um, for agency like us, you know, who provide uh, out of town uh, rides to uh, people that are going away probably like an hour, an hour and a half drive. Um, they have medical appointments and we need to wait for them sometimes uh, an hour, uh, two hours or so. Um, we're not getting paid for the time that um, we are waiting for, for the patient, but um, we can come back either. So we really can't it's, it's kind of like a wasted time for, for us because we don't get paid and the drivers cannot come back to pick up other drive, uh, drivers. So I wonder if there is a way to get paid for the time that we're waiting. Um, I know, you know, if you get a taxi, they, they make you pay. Um, and increase rates, you know, for uh, out, of, uh, out of town trips. Uh, like someone said, we, we also have short uh, um, driver shortage here, so um, it will help us, you know, to to be able to do something when it comes to wage increases for drivers. Thank you for those comments. We'll move on to the next caller. Andrew Toms, your line is unmuted. Okay, thank you, and I appreciate this opportunity. What I would like to recommend is some uh, coordination with other agencies, such that all the compliance requirements regarding driver background screenings or vehicle inspection and those requirements are identical. Uh, quite often, we have providers that may be compliant with one agency, but would not be compliant with another agency because they have different requirements. And if that could be streamlined across the board, I'm talking about government funded agencies um, that would really help a lot they're quite often resistant to wanting to be compliant with several different uh, clients thank you michelle Watkins, your line is unmuted thank you uh, just as what was being said standardization is always very very helpful uh, so that everybody is on the same page, that it doesn't vary and somebody saying, well, I could do it over there, why can't I do it over here? So I definitely would support standardization. Uh, we have drivers, all of our drivers are required to be certified as past drivers. So, uh, you know, that's just something in our area that's mandated by our insurance carriers. Um, also specific to CMS, uh, something that I think would be very helpful, uh, especially based on my healthcare background prior to getting into transportation, is that whenever we had CMS audits, people would dread them because the focus was only on the negative and never any positive feedback about what was working well. On that note, um, whether it be in healthcare or transportation, I think it would be very helpful if CMS is able to regularly meet with service providers 
in particular areas or regions on a regular basis, such as a monthly basis, um, be able to have conversations. What are some of the challenges as a process in the transportation system we are encountering? Not necessarily are limited to CMS, but these are the challenges in our area. For example, my organization is the only nonprofit transportation provider in the Western rural area of Virginia. Uh, we have challenges that are very unique, and yet the vast majority of policy and procedure is based on the private for profits. So it creates some awkward situations for us, some um, sometimes unreasonable demands on us as a nonprofit, very small organization. So I think having regular communication, um, being able to get feedback that when we present, we have this challenge some conversation or guidance. These are, these are some things that might be working with these other organizations. Think about trying to do it with yours. You know, we don't have all the answers, so we would welcome feedback, suggestions, uh, guidance to help kind of navigate um, how things are operating so that ultimately we're creating a win-win situation, especially for the vulnerable riders we are transporting. Thank you. Christy Kant-Pohl, your line is unmuted. Yeah, um, going along with standardization of requirements, I'm in a state where, first of all, requirements under Medicaid for things like background screenings um, are inconsistent between federal funders of transportation. So can CMS get on the same page with requirements as for example, the US Department of Veterans Affairs or the Federal Transit Administration, there's an organization um, called CCAM, Coordinating Council on Access and Mobility, that um, has been trying to address this, I think, for decades, but really um, nothing concrete has ever come out from them, and it really needs to be addressed. Secondly, Medicaid funding is administered within my state by multiple state agencies. So if I'm getting Medicaid for NEMT, um, you know, from like straight from Medicaid, the requirements are different from if the MCO is funding it. And then of course the requirements are definitely different if um, it's a waiver service funding it through aging or through developmental disabilities. You know, all of it's Medicaid dollars, but all of the requirements are different and it makes it really difficult for providers um, to comply with that. So thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Vincent, your line is unmuted. Jordan, Vincent, your line is unmuted. Aaron Thomas, your line is unmuted. Hi, um, as a rural transit provider, um, you know, I, I'd like to echo some of the things that have been said before, but we have um, several uh, contracts with brokers, you know, Medicaid and managed care um, that are all really burdensome. They're all requiring similar documentation, but they all have their own portals, their own billing processes, um, and their own little idiosyncrasies. Um, we also happen to be a federal section 5311 public transportation provider. So we also, already have oversight from INDOT. And I was just wondering if there can be flexibilities given to organizations such as ourselves that already have a level of oversight um, in terms of you know, our, our driver training, um, which we actually, our state provides free driver training um, through uh, the Rural Transportation Assistance Program. Um, and, you know, for me, ideally, I'd love to just see the brokers eliminated, but um, regardless, rates need to make sure that they're taking into account to the actual cost. Um, you know, rural cost per trip is far higher uh, than other areas, for example. Um, and I'd also echo what I heard someone else say earlier in regards to the consideration for um, capital needs and sustainability of the program. Thank you. Roderick, your line is unmuted. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. 
Hi, uh, this is Roger Bondison from the state of Maine, and <clears throat> I do echo the, the desire to have some sort of standardization for background screening. In Maine, we have three brokers covering the state, and by policy and by contract, we require the same background screenings for each broker, the same driver credentialing, uh, and that's worked pretty well in terms of consistency. Um, when it gets to patient abuse and neglect, uh, I do share concerns that it's not just about the driver. Uh, oftentimes, it's about the people you transport. And one of the things we've done uh, starting two years ago is we're phasing in the requirement to install cameras with video and audio capability. Um, because when you're at the state level, it's hard to investigate something like that without uh, you know, getting into the he said, she said contest. And so um, we know that that's had a uh, impact, at least in terms of um, deterring bad behavior. So another thing that happens, though, when passengers, <clears throat> some of them uh, engage in bad behavior is that eventually they run out of transporters and drivers who are willing to transport them. Because uh, like a lot of states, we don't have a robust transportation network here in Maine. So um, at that point, they're relegated to what we call mileage reimbursement, or maybe a family member can transport them and we reimburse them for mileage. But uh, I, I, you know, because of the lack of drivers, uh, if, some, if some members engage in bad behavior all the time, they're going to run out of people to transport them. Um, one of the things that we do also to enforce uh, driver credentialing is that we conduct audits of each of the brokers and their transporters, and we specifically look for, you know, all the background screenings being done and the um, credentialing of drivers. I would say that I'm not in favor of enrolling drivers as you would uh, physicians in, a, in the provide enrollment. I, I fear that would drive, uh, literally drive people away from driving. Um, I do concur with standardization of background checks, but the more stuff we pile on transporters and drivers, I think the more we're gonna make it difficult um, for them to come in. Thank you. Thank you. Martha, your line is unmuted. Hello and good afternoon. I just wanted to give a, a quick thought on the patient abuse, neglect and exploitation. Um, I think that that is probably the most underreported thing. And the way that we could help and see a bigger difference is to have um, consistency with the abuse registries. I'm not sure if you all with CMS are aware or if other folks in the industry are aware, but there are only 26 states that actually have an, an elder abuse um, reporting registry. So if we could see more of that, right now the only way that you can determine if someone has had that abuse or been reported for abuse or neglect is if it were a criminal charge. Um, and so if we could get some legislation and things like that to have all states um, participate in that and make it more of a national, national check, I think that would help identify folks that are, um, for lack of a better word, just bad folks and making sure that we have the consistent reporting. I've heard that topic, I guess, the whole time we've been on the call today about making consistent standards. Um, Dan mentioned earlier about an organization NIMTAC, that that's exactly what we're trying to do is create these standards and help create training and work with some of the other states to make sure we're doing a lot of these same things. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Katie, your line is unmuted. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I represent a rural transit provider in the state of Oregon. And um, my challenge has been to actually get an agreement in place with a brokerage firm. Um, I've been corresponding with our regional brokerage firm for over six months. And um, there it seems to be a lack of accountability 
on some on the brokerage firm. Um, they keep on um, making excuse after excuse as to why they can't provide um, a contract, and that is that their contract is not ready to be released. And to me, this seems like a very uh, like a red flag. So, I'm not sure what kind of accountability they are held to as far as providing contracts. Um, and also like to add, I am a, um, I represent a public transit agency. And so we do have um, oversight and strict reg regulations for our drivers and background screenings and um, driver accountability. We also uh, have video surveillance in all of our vehicles which really do help to deter um, criminal behavior and abuse. Thank you. Carol, your line is unmuted. Carol Long, your line is unmuted. Stan Stipes, your line is unmuted. There we go. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Thank you. Well, um, uh, I I think it's really clear from all the comments being made, and I'll just add my name to the list of the need for standardization. Um, the reason we created NEMTAC uh, a few years ago was in order to uh, attempt to bring the industry together from within the industry to create, uh, you know, standards and, you know, in training and background checks and the rest of it to, you know, to uh, uh, eliminate some of the confusion. Um, so would really encourage you, and as I said, I'll add my name to the list to really dig into NEMTAC. And I think I've, I've made that recommendation to uh, CMS before. Um, secondly, when, you, when credentialing and training are created, uh, the industry is continuously evolving. And, and I've heard comments about you know, Uber and Lyft and you know, having to adhere to a different set of standards. <laughs> But I think there is a there is a a way to align the credentialing and the training and the the actual service provided to the need of the patient. Um, that's it is easy to do today. Easy is a four letter word, but it's easy to do today. It just has to be um, there has to be oversight to make sure that that's what's happening. But it's appropriate. It isn't appropriate for someone who only needs curb to curb service uh, to necessarily have a driver that's got in-depth, uh, you know, CPR and background checks and, and the rest of that, because they, it's just not a need. However, uh, you know, for any patient who does need door-to-door, hand-to-hand -door, -hand service, that should be a requirement. And that is on those who provide the service to make sure that, that the appropriate provider is aligned to, to that patient. And, and so then my, my other recommendation is oversight. Their, their oversight has to go beyond grievances and service levels and mistrips. It, it has to go to the level of the actual service being provided. That doesn't mean spend more money. It, it just means use the data that's there and, and hold the entities accountable to, uh, to providing the service. Um, and I'm also going to applaud uh, Bill Caesar in the state of Virginia uh, for having really taken a lot of these steps and moved along. And, and uh, so, Bill, uh, I do encourage you to get, um, you know, all the details you can to, to CMS. So um, uh, that's about all I have. I think my two minutes are up. Thank you, Stan. Um, we have about 12 people remaining in the queue at this point. We have just a little, around 15 minutes left for comment. So do want to, A, encourage people to be uh, very concise if they can in their remaining comments, and also prioritize any new information uh, that hasn't that is not an echo of comments that have been made already, just to be efficient with the remaining 20 minutes. We do appreciate everybody's comments so far um, and look forward to the remaining, uh, hearing from the remaining folks. Thank you. Carol Long, your line is unmuted. 
Carol, your line is unmuted. Tom, your line is unmuted. Thank you very much. Um, so just kind of reiterating off of what uh, Dan Reed and Uh, it looks like Tom has been remuted. Can somebody oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I hear you. So yeah, as Dan Reed and Stan said uh, previously, you know, adopting one set of uh, standards within the industry would be very beneficial. Uh, NEMTAC is doing a great job of that with their ANSI accreditation standards. Um, but also kind of adding on to that, you know, decreasing that amount of ambiguity and transparency within the industry uh, to create that standard. But then also, uh, as many people have said, behind uh, reimbursement, which is another conversation. But, you know, having those standards and creating a high quality uh, service would then, you know, be based off of KPIs such as on time performance and customer ratings to drive. Uh, a set of other, you know, things that we're, um, you know, frustrated with in the industry. Thank you. Thank you. Nick, your line is unmuted. Good afternoon, mm -hmm. this is Nick Minetto on behalf of the Medical Transportation Access Coalition. I'm getting an echo here. Go ahead and try again, Nick. Kathy Lynn, your line is unmuted. Kathy, your line is unmuted. Hi, I, it, might, it might be showing a separate names. This is actually Nisha from Lyft. Um, just wanted to reiterate some of the things that um, that Stan and, and Dan have said, but we Lyft agrees that training standards should reflect the acuity of patients being transported. Transported. Um, we provide a curb to curb ambulatory uh, NEMT service, so riders need to be cognitively and physically able to get in and out of a lift by themselves without driver support. Um, so to Stan's point, um, it's not necessarily always appropriate to have the higher level or necessary to have the higher level of training um, compared to other um, uh, compared to other levels of, uh, of transportation support. Um, we're really here to reinforce the transportation networks, make them more robust, but also open up um, the ability for transportation providers who do have um, that higher level of care and are more equipped and trained to support those higher acuity patients to actually be able to get all of those rides as well, while we can support um, the more ambulatory and uh, and curb to curb rides. Um, secondly, just want to reiterate that we do support thorough statewide background checks. Um, as any EMT providers in states, we follow statewide background checks. Um, and we actually do engage in continuous background checks for all of our drivers, along with screening for federal uh, and state health exclusion database screening lists. So just wanted to reiterate that and, and keep that as a recommendation to particularly um, definitely reflect the acuity of patients being transported, transported when we think about training. Thank you. Nikki, your line is unmuted. Hi, yeah, I'm calling from uh, an MCO in the Midwest. Um, the things that we would like to really see more clarity around um, is whether or not we have the ability to backdate eligibility for drivers 
um, because they have to register with the state first before they can register with the MCOs. Um, that can lead to a, a 60 to 90 day lag, which obviously affects um, all parties. It affects our members, it affects the um, drivers and their organizations. Um, the other thing is we'd like clarity around whether a driver is an anchor registrant, meaning that as long as they're registered, they can work for more than one taxi service or driving service, um, rather than having to um, re-enroll and reaffiliate each time they um, work for a new or different organization. Um, the other thing that we would like clarity around that there seems to be a lot of confusion about is whether a Medicaid ID number or Medicaid enrollment is required if you're mode three or four, um, mode six, seven, and eight, it makes total sense because of the type of transportation they're providing. Um, but mode three and four, for the most part, are going to be taxi. Um, so we want to better understand what the requirements are, if they are exactly the same for all modes, or if there's going to be a difference. Um, and we would also like that same clarity around background checks. So regardless of the mode of transportation they are providing, are they going to be required to have the same level of background checks? That's all I have. Thank you. Medex Transportation Association, your line is unmuted. Medex Transportation Association, your line is unmuted. Danny, your line is unmuted. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, just real quick, uh, I, I work on behalf of a program integrity for a state Medicaid agency. Uh, we would like to see uh, MPI enumeration for the NEMT providers, um, the agencies and the drivers. Uh, right now there's CFR that prohibits that, but then there is um, some contrary work happening where uh, some of those providers are still getting um, an MPI enumerated through NPES. So um, would like to see that uh, CFR change to require those providers to have that. There's there's a lot of value in having that MPI for, uh, for, for claims, for uh, provider screening, reporting, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry, your line is unmuted. Sherry, your line is unmuted. I, I didn't have my hands up, I apologize. Thank you. Laquina, your line is unmuted. Hello. Um, my comment was about, let's see, go back to screening. Maybe they should assign a worker for new providers. I'm a new provider in Ohio as far as transportation. Um, and I am switching from being an independent provider for patient care over to transportation. And I am finding it very difficult, confusing. Um, I've just learned about brokerages recently from other providers. Um, there's no one to help guide us um, to when we're first starting out. And then it's like, um, you have a lot of other people already doing it, but I'm also seeing a lot of companies around me, I'm in Ohio, Akron, Ohio, shutting down because of lack of being able to hire drivers, restrictions, um, just a lot of other things going on that you can't keep up. And, and for me being a new driver, uh, new trying to come in to help my community, uh, people that are in poverty um, that need to get to appointments. Um, it's very hard because you have everybody has their own rules, you know, and uh, you know the brokers got their rules, the DODD got their rules, everybody got all their own rules, and it's, that goes back to that standardization. It needs to be, CMS needs to govern these rules. It should be the same across the board, the same across the board, and also uh, real quick as far as um, age twenty one. Um, I said that too as mine, but 
in the state of Ohio, it says they can be, as long as they're 18 or older with at least two years of driving experience, a clean driving record, yada, 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 um, they can drive. I have a son who's 20 and the insurance would not pick him up until he hit 21. And then they shot the rate so high. So that needs to be um, governed because what if that was a worker and he wasn't my son, he doesn't live with me, he's grown. Um, and, that, and that was a worker off the street. The same thing applies because they're 21, they're considered youth and they shoot the rate up. So how am I gonna hire younger uh, adults who wanna work um, or get into the business if the insurance company shooting my rates and I'm new out here. I haven't even made a profit yet because I'm just now trying to get into the uh, business. And there's so many barriers that's blocking small business owners like me that are trying to come into the business to help a need because I just see a big company shut down because of all things, but I'm determined to help uh, the people that are in need in my community. So right. that's something Thanks. I would like to see. Thank you, Laquena. We have about seven people left in the queue and just a couple of minutes left. So I do wanna move quickly. And if uh, folks that are remaining in the queue can make uh, quick comments and um, again, prioritize new comments. Thank you. Thomas Gibbs, your line is unmuted. Yes, to, to follow up on uh, two of the earlier inputs, uh, standardization is great, but everybody ha might have a different business model. For instance, I particularly choose vans that are less than 15 passengers, so I don't have to require a CDL. I do that on purpose. Any CDL driver in my neck of the woods, you can't touch them for less than $30 an hour. So I purposely, you know, my standard doesn't need to be the same as somebody who forces, you know, a bus driver licensing because they, they run a bigger, they might have a shuttle bus with 30 seats. So standardization is great, but it's not a one size fits all. Secondly, my insurance company specifically forbids first aid kits because then I'm rendering care. If I put a Band-Aid on a patient, it's considered rendering care, and that puts me into a whole different category of risk for them. And as silly as it sounds, as much as I think a first aid kit is warranted, we have to sort of pay attention to how it might affect that bigger picture of if they recategorize us and make our rates go up, is it really worth having a first aid kit on board? So those are the kinds of things that we can't sort of one size doesn't necessarily fit all. Some of us are small companies that can't afford these sort of rate increases because of a first aid kit. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Ivan, your line is unmuted. Hey everyone, uh, so I represent a taxi company out in uh, San Jose, California. Um, and uh, it's just kind of daunting to hear everyone uh, call for standardization of requirements when that's literally what Taxi has been doing for nearly the last decade in response to the emergence of Uber and Lyft and rideshare companies and such. Uh, we're continuing that effort um, in the NEMT space. Um, as you know, with uh, the disruption of rideshare, many taxi providers have pivoted towards non-emergency medical transportation and non-medical transportation. And uh, we didn't shed the regulatory environment in which taxi exists. We still are very heavily regulated by our local municipalities. Um, we have a standardization uh, um, of background checks, standardization of training. Uh, we work very closely with our local brokers to, um, to communicate uh, those, those training requirements to, to drivers uh, who are affiliated with us under an independent contractor model. So I think um, I would recommend that CMS engage in deeper conversations and a broader dialogue with taxi providers who I believe are ahead of the game in terms of uh, regulatory requirements, right? I think that there could be a lot of benefit in the CMS um, engaging taxi providers who are providing the higher tier services in wheelchair vans, as well as what Lyft has deemed the lower tier services, which is a definition that Lyft has conveniently come up with to um, you know, break into the, the NEMT space. We don't consider those lower tier, and I don't think any brokers or any providers here on this call would consider someone who requires curb to curb service um, a lower tier service, right? Um, requiring less requirements for drivers. I think that 
the liability and the risk remains, right? Uh, as long as they're in our care, even someone who is dropped off on a curb could slip and fall and there. That's, that's, you're still liable for that, right? So I think that um, CMS, DHCS should work with taxi companies. Um, I mean, I think it also in terms of provider enrollment, provider enrollment process is not designed for taxi companies. We have over close to 200 drivers in our fleet um, putting 200 drivers through that enrollment process is a nightmare. Um, it's not conducive of a fleet of our size. Um, so I think there needs to be also more discussion on that front. Um, uh, anyway, that's my that's my two cents. Thank you, Ivan. We're going to take one more caller, and I apologize to those that we're not able to get in today. If you want to use the chat feature or the email address that's been posted to prevent, provide your comments, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Destiny, your line is unmuted. Hi, I just have a quick comment in regards to pretty much the uh, two things. As far as the background checks, um, I know the company that I work for, we do uh, a national and a county whenever we submit a background check. So as, as far as I know, it's been accepted by every broker that we're under, um, as well as our insurance. I don't know if that'll help anybody to just select those two options when submitting background checks. But um, I think that the need for pretty much reviewing brokers yeah. is important. Um, the brokers need to be screened pretty much for the setup of their systems, um, pretty much to ensure they're following up with the companies that work under them regarding cancellations and no-shows. Also confirming the trip details from the clients that are calling in um, to reserve with them because a lot of times trips are wasted. Um, of course, the driver's time, the fuel with not just a simple phone call back to the companies that work under the brokers to say, hey, this client is no longer going or um, to say the information of the address has changed. A lot of times we have to do our own um, pretty much homework for the broker to make sure that all the details are correct. We send the correct vehicle, things like that. I think there should be a minimum requirement um, for the brokers as far as just their logistics, knowing basically what the company that works under them, what the business entails. A lot of times the information that we need isn't even available from the broker um, just because they aren't very informed on the specifics of non-emergency medical transport. Thank you, Destiny. Um, we we have uh, really appreciate your comments there. Uh, that concludes uh, our session for today. We really appreciate uh, you joining us for this first NAMT listening session and for providing your valuable comments. CMS will take all of your input into consideration. In addition to today's listening session, there will be three more over the next several weeks. These sessions are program integrity, correct billing concerns, and documentation and data requirements for NEMT providers that will be held on Thursday, March 31st, 2022. Economic factors and cost containment challenges in NEMT on Thursday, April 7th. NEMT coordination topics, brokers, MCO, community transport and paratransit services on Wednesday, April 13th, 2022. Just a reminder that today's session was recorded. If there are any other topics of interest for your organization, please go to medicaid.gov to register. Uh, direct links are also listed on the slide. Um, we, again, really appreciate your joining the call today, and we look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Have a great afternoon.